since 2.6 is just around the corner, I thought I'd gamble on a little theory on the Abyss Order's motives behind attempting to take the chasm and find out what they plan to achieve based on what happened so far. For this video to last even after 2.6, I thought I'd merge a theory for 2.6 and an overall theory about the Abyss Order. This theory is gonna be based on the fallen star that left the chasm about 2000 years ago and the star fragments that's said to be left in some parts of Liwe, which is going to be the theorized reason for why the Abyss is in the chasm. Uh, we'll also make a theory on what the Abyss intend to do with the chasm and find out their plans based on what we've seen so far since 1.1, as well as a bit of speculation on everything we've seen in the 2.6 trailer. But before we understand their motive, I want to go back to patch 1.1 in the Unreconciled Stars event. Why? Because it's the first incident that we see a glimpse of what the Abyss Order's intentions might be. If you can recall, the events includes falling stars that cause people to sleep, as well as a pretty considerably large meteorite with a special core inside of it. Now I know that we weren't fighting the Abyss in this event, but rather the Fatui, but using this star fall event, we can link the chasm's history with whatever reason the Abyss has with going into the chasm in the first place. A quick refresher to 1.1 is that we needed to quell the meteor's aura in some way while fighting off the monsters that were attached to the meteorite. And this meteorite, although not originating from Teyvat, has the same characteristics as ley lines. The core of this meteorite also has certain traits when interacted with by certain heightened or skilled individuals. Scaramouche was entranced in some sort of dream when we found him, and what he got from the core were, namely, nuggets of insight and knowledge unknown to the people of Devat. In the ending cutscene, we see a boy Scaramouche dreaming after interacting with the meteorite's core and was awakened to quite a revelation that the stars and the sky was a lie. A lie that only serves to cover whatever is behind the artificial curtains we call stars and possibly even to cover up the true Celestia of which is not that floating chunk of land in the sky. The uncertainty of Celestia's gods and lack of the Archon's way of disseminating information regarding Celestia is already apparent in both the game and the manga. But back to Scaramouche and the Meteorite Core, what relation would a fallen star from patch 1.1 have with 2.6? and the chasm. Well, to me, the history of the chasm isn't as muddy and unknown as you may think. Now, the chasm as you know today, as this crater slash quarry looking establishment, wasn't made by human hands. To your surprise, 6,000 years ago, this place was but a flat and open land, a barren landscape compared to Liwe and Mondstadt's verdant geography. You can find all the information from the book Records of Jiu Yun, and a little excerpt from this book is that in a time immemorial, even when Zhong Li was still young, a star fell from the sky and transformed the plain, and made it into the crater known as the Chasm. Its effects, however, were not just the crater itself, but the jades and ores would emerge from the ground because of the star's descent as well as its own characteristics, being able to change the form and material within these ores. This ushered in a millennium of industrial mining and trade for Liwe and its citizens. The star and its characteristics were similar to the veins such as Dragonfall and many other ore types within Liwe. The change it made, however, allowed the stones the ability to harbor souls and spirits. Along with that, they could also listen to ley lines and the echoes and movements of the mountains. The only difference being that this meteorite, as well as its fragments that's been scattered around Liwe, had a quote-unquote proud and agitated temper. And over the years since we know what happened throughout history, you can be sure that it's going to show off that type of personality. So as we all know what happened 2000 years ago, the Archon War occurred and the Chasm became quite a hotspot for monsters and creatures. And the endless wars and skirmishes through the land near the Chasm was enough to agitate the fallen star. The meteorite had enough of all the killing and straight up left the chasm, flying away and said to have went to the heavens. The war within the crater however still continued, until the slow end of the Archon War. 
but the star didn't leave Teyvat completely. It is said that a shard of the fallen star was left somewhere within the Leisha area. If you don't know where that is, it's here. Basically where we found Tartaglia's toy factory in his story quest with Deucer. And the fragment of this fallen star being in this location as well as having be the reason for the recent unknown shifts would make for a great reel in from older stories, a new segment of Celestia, and gods to be introduced, and for the Abyss Order to have a new way to cause some sort of ruckus within Teyvat. This area in Liwe is also said to be where Azdaha and Zhongli fought before being sealed away, being mentioned in as recent as 2.5. It can also add more lore to Liwa's history, as well as a lot of these ruins and areas in the Lisha region rarely being used for story content as well, especially for something as important as this one. But why would the Unreconciled Stars event and the Fallen Star in the Chasm be related to each other? Give me, you might want to sit down before I send you up the stars with them. I know I'm merely mentioning historical events and facts here, but here's a little point in the theory that would piece together both stars and it's from tenacity of the millilith, as well as finding out why things are happening within the chasm. See, if you read and sum up the entire excerpt from tenacity of the millilith, it's basically about a group of millilith soldiers and an unnamed yaksha that defended and plunged themselves deep into the crevices of the chasm, fighting endless hordes of the abyss before finally falling into a quote-unquote deep slumber. Now doesn't that sound like it's from 1.1 meteors? Now the problem I have here is how they worded the Yaksha's situation. You have lines saying that, and I quote, The brave Yaksha and fearless citizenry would sink into an exhausted slumber in the dark lair of the enemy. This is them being neck deep into the chasm when the abyss attacked. Zhongli or Rex Lapis even observed a vow of silence when it all ended. And it was further concluded that the Yaksha had once soared through celestial heights, had now returned to a free existence amongst the clouds. So that should mean that the nameless Yaksha is basically dead, right? Am I not right? He's either dead, asleep, or not spiritually there in some way. But here's where Hoyoverse start to make sudden cheeky cliffhanger sequels. The headpiece of the tenacity of the Millilith mentions, and I quote, When the gloom that had filled the skies above the chasm had finally dissipated, the Yaksha disappeared without a trace. As the general and his men who left their helmets on the battlefield, they rest there in peace forevermore. End quote. So we can conclude that the Millilith and the soldiers were either dead or asleep inside of the chasm. But what about the Yaksha? Is he dead or asleep or did this guy just ascend and become the art of war by Sun Tzu incarnate? To me, I think he ended up having his own domain or finding the chasm domain after fighting for so long. I mean, that would explain the prolonged silence and why he would disappear, right? An Archon wouldn't know where you are if you enter a domain with unknown origin, right? So my theory here is that the nameless Yaksha ended up in the newest domain, and this artifact set Vermilion hereafter is basically what was left of him. I won't go into the details, but basically this theory is that the nameless Yaksha is this purple guy that went with the Millilith into the chasm. And when all the fighting ended, the Yaksha found himself inside the chasm domain, which would explain why he would disappear without a trace. You can check the artifact set headpiece and his face for some comparison, and they look pretty much the same. The next bet is going to be the upside down city that has the same structural assets as Enkanamiya for some reason. This pedestal, these gold engravings, the doorways, the weird path or hole that was in that camera scene, and even the walls and interior of the underground city all have the same assets as Enkanamiya. Now I'm assuming that Hoyoverse just recycled these assets, but considering the Abyss's involvement for basically two patches back to back in Enkanamiya alone, it wouldn't be random or sudden that the Abyss would find another place of similar origin. Considering the fact that the Abyss were trying to grab or tamper relics from history, namely the book Before the Sun and Moon which holds vital information about the very first civilization of Teyvat, the Dainichi Mikoshi which was the creation of both a genius sage and the wisdom of a timeless god, Easteroth. And now in 2.6, which is this 
underground city's stone-looking object being pointed at a upside-down chamber that would look like a lot of Enkanomiya's rooms. Now this sounds like they are also looking for truths hidden beneath Teyvat, similar to Albedo and Scaramouche, but their reasoning behind this is a lot more revolutionary than maybe what Saritza is planning or Scaramouche is planning on his own. Finally, we have the Skyfrost Nail. You can also see these weird lines and auras that is either holding it in place or maybe it's coming from the nail itself. Now, I can't put anything around this part because only Vindagnir has the same Skyfrost Nail and that the reason behind it happening to Vindagnir, theoretically, was that Vindagnir was getting a little too comfortable with their star silver tree and the wildest theory i have regarding this is that maybe this underground city was once a part of either Enkanamiya or Vindagnir. And thousands of years ago in the Second Heavenly War, the second one threw the snail at Enkanamiya before it got destroyed or before Enkanamiya was plunged into the depths. And for some reason, this part of the city was teleported or transported here into the chasm. I mean, it would explain why Enkanamiya fell into the depths in the first place since nobody really know why Enkanamiya fell off, only that a war happened, and Enkanamiya was a byproduct of that war. This would also add on to why the assets of the Upside Down City is the same as Enkanamiya's. A plot hole there though is that why would a chunk of Enkanamiya be in the chasm? Maybe Easteroth teleported it, or maybe the second one had that kind of power. But regarding all this about the nail and the upside down city, I'm gonna have to let you guys comment on what you think. Anyway, now that I've said all that, we can finally relate the characteristics of the fallen star, the fragment of the fallen star, the meteorite from 1.1, the similarities from Enkanamiya, and finally, the trailer from 2.6. The meteorite from 1.1 can make people sleep and daze them for a prolonged period of time, until treated. The Fallen Star, although no description, we can relate its characteristics to both Tenacity of the Millilith and the Yaksha cinematic video, which ended with the Millilith falling into a deep slumber and the Yaksha succumbing to the darkness, which we are now theorizing that the Yaksha ended up inside of the chasm's domain. Next, the 2.6 trailer shows off the Traveler and Danesleaf in front of some hilly churls that don't seem to care for their presence, which could mean that they were asleep or dead. The aura around them, however, look very similar to the karmic aura in Xiao's story, but this time it's purple, which could mean that it was either the karma from the nameless Yaksha, which is this purple guy, the aura coming from the abyss, which could be a good reason for why a lot of hilly churls are coming into the chasm, or an untold effect of the star's aura, which is very similar to ley lines, where it attracts monsters. For the third, the meteorite from 1.1, similar to ley lines can attract creatures and monsters in its given area. Hence the way we did the event, fight monsters and wait for the thingamadu to finish all its stuff. The fallen star, once it crashed into the plains, Zhongli immediately called forth the Melodith to defend the miners from the incoming abyss creatures. The nameless Yaksha was also among them. In the 2.6 trailer, hilly churls and maybe even more creatures are for some reason wandering into the mines and never coming back. This could be because of the abyss order like I said, but it could also be because the abyss order was using some sort of trinket that they found, which I think would be the fragment of the fallen star. Since this incident of creatures going into the chasm only happened very recently. Recently. Second to the last, the meteorite from 1.1 that crashed into Tevet was already a target of the Fatui. The chasm with its only known history being of a fallen star would be the only reason why the Abyss Order would have their eyes on it. There's something in that upside down city and that second Skyfrost nail. Which is a big debunk for this theory, but here's a quick rebuttal. In the 2.6 trailer, you can see the Abyss Lector using some sort of stone or a rock or a shard of something into the upside down chamber. The stone also emits a unique light similar to the Traveler's Magic, the light from Enkanomiya's Dainichi Mikoshi, and if I'm pulling strings here, Miko's Special Ritual. Not to mention that it has the same beam of light and aura as Enkanomiya from 2.5. 
which would mean that whatever that object is, isn't of human origin. Lastly, but is actually kind of the least, the fallen star that fell and created the chasm was said to have fragmented into another piece. Now how big that piece was, we actually don't know. But that piece apparently landed in the Lisha region, which never really had a story regarding why there were multiple ruins here and there. The descriptions of each area within the region don't say much, but the fact that a fragment of a star that fell into the chasm ended up here, and why it hasn't had any relevant story makes me think that this is where the next story leads. So putting all of that stuff that I said together again, here's a summary for anyone who made it this far into the video. My theory is that the abyss was here to harness whatever was inside the fragment of the fallen star. And that fragment of the star will have to have a little bit of a race against the abyss order for. But sadly, we ended up being too late, hence why the abyss lector has the fragment. Dane's leaf can either be already there before we get to the chasm or once we open the seal and get in. Since the abyss order used portals, then maybe Dane's leaf will be inside of the chasm when we find him. Either way, he'll need to have some sort of explanation for how he got back from those portals. Next, we find the underground city and see similarities with Enkanamiya. If not, then the Enkanamiya segment is easily bonked off. We find the hilly churls who were either asleep or affected by the slumber debuff from what happened years ago, be it from either the karmic aura of the Yaksha, the abyss order's new power, or the star's leyline-like effect. So in the end, we find this lector, try to stop him but find out it was a bit too late. Then we can finally cut into the scene at the end of the trailer. What comes after that, I think, isn't going to bode well for our travelers. Since this is actually the first time that the Abyss wins at whatever they were trying to achieve. Unlike patch 1.4, 2.4 and 2.5, we kind of won every time we met with the Abyss, and they always just end up running, or for some reason we just let them go. This time however, they might have achieved what they were gunning for in the chasm. But again, theories as always, so if you think one of these are going to happen, or if you have your own theory as to what might happen, do comment down below, and tell me what you guys think of what I've thought of so far. So that is going to be the end of my latest theory on the chasm before 2.6 comes out. If this is right, then the abyss would actually be gaining the upper hand, right? Because in the trailer, they basically won. So whatever happens after that, we're gonna have to find out. Again, I'd like to thank Honey Hunters Discord, especially the Lorecraft channel for always throwing out their own theories and answering a lot of my random questions from time to time. So please go there, check them out. They're really nice guys. They're, they're pretty fun to be with. Before ending this video, I want to make a quick announcement that I have a Twitch channel with a grand follower number of two. I'm gonna be streaming variety content there, so basically it's not just gonna be Genshin. We're also going to be speaking a bit of Filipino, or Tagalog as you guys know, since we're basically just having fun in the stream. So if you wanna watch me, then go to my Twitch channel and come and say hi. Maybe you'll enjoy what we're doing. As always, of course, if you enjoyed that video, leave a like, and if you want to see more of what I'm doing and what I'm posting, you might want to click on that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you can be updated whenever I post a new video. And that's gonna be it for this um, new theory I have for 2.6. Anyways, I hope to see you guys again in the next video, yeah? Bye!